Dang it. Yep. Tap it in. Just tap, tap, tap it in. Ladies and gentlemen. Let's go see what the squirrels are up to. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Between the Sharks. In theory, everything I need to put disc brakes on early Ford spindles for our 27 Ford Touring Hot Rod project is in these two boxes. Still feels a little weird to me that I'm putting disc brakes on a hot rod. I know it's the right choice. There's no question about it. But, uh, you know, I must be getting old. I'm putting performance, economy, and safety above my ego, you know? Having never done this, I thought I'd bring you along, like literally from the unboxing step, because I don't know how they do it. Um, there's two boxes. This is one of two. So, I mean, this is kind of nice. You know, if you're gonna put your own kit together, this is labeled 69 to 77 midsize caliper, which is a Chevrolet, I think, A body caliper. Super common. This is stuff you could get at the parts store and sort of, you know, kind of make your own. But I don't think you'd beat this price, to tell you the truth. Got it, okay. So this looks like bearing and seal adapters. Bearing and seal kit. 8 a.m. Sunday. Hardware kit. Caliper adapters. I mean, look. Speedway had such a bad reputation 20 years ago because they were like, you know, the street rod guy putting little hot rod shops out of business and stuff like that, but. I know that ain't cool, but I am saying what they are doing as a service is like you can buy just this adapter kit that has the brackets, the bearings, the seals, the adapters, and go out and buy your own, you know, rotors, your own calipers, your parts and pieces. Like they're not keeping it a secret as to what goes into these things. So, you know, you can avoid Speedway if you want to and just buy the bare minimum from them. So, brake pads, okay. Uh, dust seals, brake line kit clips, brake lines, crush washers, caliper pins. One bearing is throwing me off. Like, why do I just have one? Because I don't. I have two. Box number two. Get yet another Speedway sticker. Um, just wish the yellow and purple wasn't so, you know? I think this box may be just the rotors. One rotor. Two rotors. Okay, that's it. You know, again, these are 69 to 72 GM brake rotors. Most of their A-body cars, meaning you can go pick them up at your local O'Reilly's or whatever auto parts store you prefer to use or your junkyard or your backyard. They did not send any paper instructions, but you know, Apparently I didn't find these things in a paper catalog, so we'll consult the old internet. Let's go get involved. All right, so I was looking at the instructions and the first two steps are getting these adapters ready for the spindles. And we'll talk about that in just a second, but it claims that there is a bearing race adapter and there is not one independently packaged. So out of this package, I pulled out one of the inner bearings and I checked out the race. So if you're doing this independently, this is bearing number L68149 with race number L68110. So you can see how this bearing fits in there. You know, it seats all the way down into this race. If you put this bearing in the race that comes with this disc, it actually sits probably almost an eighth proud, like it's not all the way seated. So I guess we're not actually looking for an adapter, but we are indeed installing this race instead of this race. So we'll have to knock this one out, put this one in. Not a big deal, just a second. Now the other thing is 
these adapters are press fit. So we could either beat the pants off of them, hammer on our spindles, or like they suggest in the instructions, we can just throw these fellers in the oven for 20 minutes or so at 400 degrees. You can heat them up with a torch, but I mean, that'll work just fine, but we got plenty to do. So getting these guys cooking in the oven while my better half is out of the house is the way to go, in my opinion. So they'll be ready whenever we need them. Fire the old girl up to 400 degrees or so. This is my kind of baking. So I guess we'll just, hmm, that's not gonna wanna sit there. All right, there you go. In you go. All right. All right, so while those things are cooking, we gotta deal with this. And this is also, the first hiccup I found, meaning the instructions are dated from 2010. So I think they have updated this kit as they have learned and grown and um, become sort of the more powerful business they are. Maybe they were able to, you know, get the bearing companies to go ahead and make the race they needed. So in the instructions, it says you gotta knock this race out. No big deal. If you've ever changed bearings, it's the exact same situation, but it says you have to install the new race with a spacer. And I have gone through stuff, I've looked around, my rear bearing setup has the race, has the bearing, and has two seals. The front bearings just kind of exist independently. I've got a hardware kit, no spacers in there, and then this is all brake hoses and dust caps and all that other stuff. Looked around on the internet, how to's, YouTube, you know, the usual. Nobody's driving in a spacer. So we're just gonna make the assumption that the instructions are a little dated and that this is all we need to do. And if I'm wrong, I will try to let you guys know. Um, it's not even, I, I've done everything I can. I've checked on this inventory list. It's not as if spacers are supposed to be included. So I'm just going with this, it makes, sense so I guess once we drive this race in we'll know if there's a problem or at least we'll have a clue if there's a problem so let's uh, let's knock this race out if you've never done this it can be intimidating to take a hammer and a blunt object to brand new parts but don't sweat it too hard so to get at it there's a little lip on the back side here I don't know if you can see it here we go you know right in there so basically all you gotta do Flip the thing over, grab yourself a set of cheap Harbor Freight punches, and you're gonna tap it all the way around. We're gonna, you know, that's basically what we're trying to do here is knock this thing out. This is a pretty standard maintenance procedure. I mean, the biggest thing is you're trying not to wang your own hand and don't mar up this top race, which you really, have a hard time doing. Might just be hitting it against the table. Let me grab some tube first. That might be more better. Let's see how that does. Oh, yeah, that came right out. Let's do a quick comparison. Um, so that's the old race, right? And that's the new race. So I guess that's all we're replacing. You can see that this bearing seats all the way into this race. That's what we're going for. So I guess whatever the stock A body bearing was had a slightly different taper. They appear to be the same depth. If you get these mixed up, just put the one that the bearing fits in, but um, there's the part number, the one we're pulling out. And take this guy and we'll put it way out of the way because that's not the one I need. All right, the old races are out. I grabbed two pieces of four by four because we've got to drive the new race in. So we just got to tap it in, work it in with a hammer. It's not a big deal. You can get a tool set to do this. I don't think it's necessary, but if that's your jam, you can rent one probably at your local auto parts store. I've got it up on the four by fours because I don't want to be tapping against the end of our brandy new wheel studs. Got a littler hammer. Um, again, you can use all kinds of hammers just you know, tap it in, just to tap, tap, tap it in. New race, sure, it wants to go in. It wants to drive in super straight. I got some bearing grease over here. My big old tub of lard. I think I've had this for 20 years. 
and just give it a quick tap all the way around. There we go. Let's drive it on in. I'm going to go ahead and use this other race to help me get it in there. Basically by rotating it, we're just doing our best to keep it even. That's really, that's really it. All right, I'm gonna start with the punch. Just be, be gentle. Just line it up on the lip. What you don't wanna do here is mar the bearing surface. So slow and steady and you'll be all right. It will stop. You will hit a, uh, a ridge on the casting that will say, you're done, feller. All right, there you go. You can use your eyeballs on that one. All right, one race in. We're gonna do the next one exactly the same way. Time to pack bearings. Um, we need to pack the rear bearings so we can put the bearing in and add the seal to it, meaning like stick the seal on there. But because this process is what it is, and I don't have a bearing packer, which you really do not need, uh, it's kind of gross. So I'm gonna do all the bearings at once so that we can just be ready to go. Grab yourself a big old handful of bearing grease and then you take your bearing and you pack it into the bearing so basically you want to see it squeezing out until it's mashed through the rollers and coming out the inner race it's not uh, rocket science you're just forcing grease into the bearing everywhere you can we'll repeat this process on all four bearings if you start hearing a bearing go bad and you're far, far from home, it'll be a white knuckle ride, I'll tell you what. All right, Viola, gloves removed. I don't know how many times I've started this process barehanded and then forgot what I was doing and just, yeah. Bearing goes into our new race. So there's your new seal. This little rubber cone keeps the grease in, in theory. It works just like the bearing race. Uh, there is a tool for this. Do you need it? I don't think so. You just gotta be gentle. It's gotta go in straight. Um, it should be basically flush, and there is indeed a little ridge that this sits on. All right, so now we've got the inner bearing and seal installed. Time to do the other one, and man, we are cooking with peanut oil. All right, gang, got our 42 through 48 square back spindles on the bench. Apparently this kit requires zero modifications to these. If you have the 37 to 41 round spindles, there's like a little bit of grinding down you gotta do for caliper clearance or something. It's not a big deal. You gotta do that for F1 brakes. You gotta do that for all kinds of stuff. So pretty common practice. I do wanna clean these up as well as I possibly can because I don't think it will benefit us to put the spacers slash bearing adapters that are in the oven on a greasy spindle. It's not like they're gonna cool that quickly and they've been in here for a hot minute. There we go. Dun, 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 Dog. All right, don't trip and die. Wow, look at that. That worked great. Real time, boys. Just gotta let them cool now. Well, those have cooled. They're happily on there. Personally, that seems a lot easier than using a press that I don't have. Got two brake brackets. All right, they're identical. It's interesting because it says to install them on the inside, but basically, oh hey look, it goes like that. All right, this seems simple enough. We're gonna bolt them on with the hardware kit that's supplied and we'll take a look like, right after that. You guys know how to put bolts together. It says run the bolts in from the front to the back. Houston, we have a problem. I was trying to do the right thing by not opening any packages until it was time to use those packages. 
the instructions apparently existed. They were folded up like so in a little bag that had all of the hardware to put these brackets on. I've got a hardware kit. No spacers in there. So I opened it, dumped out the package on my lunch tray there, and tucked inside, invisible from the outside land. You can even see the dent in the paper are the missing spacers for the bearing race. Yep. So that means we've got to get the seal out without damaging it. Got to drop the inner bearing and we have to pound out the brand new races that we just put in in order to put these spacers in. I'm a little bummed to say the least because this had been going so, so smoothly and I thought I'd done my job by looking for these things and then I looked at the date on the instructions and I thought maybe things are just different. Well, this is where they are, boys. This is where they are. So in their defense, it does say hardware kit. It has the half inch bolts, the lock nuts, the bearing adapter right there as listed in the hardware kit. Unfortunately, these instructions were also in the hardware kit and it was not on the inventory because it's not broken down like that. So, you know, if I had noticed that on the website, I could have saved myself some trouble. Dang it. So here's the situation. We've got to get this inner bearing out. We have to get this seal out and we've got to pound the new race back out so that we can get these spacers in. Honestly, it's not that big a deal. I'm a little bit more bummed than I ought to be. So just take a couple of minutes. So there's a couple of things you can do. Um, if your spindles are on the car, one of the things that people often do is they'll take the front bearing out, right? You say your spindle's all the way through. You can screw on your castle nut and use the castle nut and you can slide the rotor off and that'll catch the bearing, which will take the seal out. Because these aren't on the car and I don't want to jack all that stuff up and I'm not really in love with that method, although it does work on the car, I use that method. I really do. Prying these seals are not very strong, so prying them usually means bending them. So there's, I happen to have this laying around stuff. I'll show you the method. You can do this with the same, you know, these things as well. Because the plan is, we're gonna flip this guy over and all I'm trying to do, I'm just using this because it's soft. This punch will work, just be gentle. Because what you're actually going to do is hit the bearing and tap on it and let the bearing catch the seal. And that way, everything will push out of the whole thing. Here we go. It? The bearing itself actually pushed against the seal, you know, sort of removing it instead of prying each piece. It just got pushed right out of its fitting, which is totally fine. So now, all we've got to do is basically repeat the process that we did earlier when we took the original brand new races out. And they came out without any damage. We're going to do the same thing, and then we're going to knock them right back in. Considering we've been over this process, I think the most important thing is being aware these are hidden in the instructions in your hardware kit. Um, not gonna lie. I watched a YouTube video of how to install this and I watched the guy install the races and he never put these in and never made mention of it. So I'm wondering if just like I did, he found them later and decided to just not reference that in the video. There we go. All right, I'm gonna do this and we'll be back as soon as that's done. All right, gang, we've gone this far together. I pounded the brand new bearing race back out. It's fine, sustained no damage. It's just a little greasy because I greased it. Um, let's, let's just see what this has to, you know. So basically the idea is that kind of goes in first. There we go. Just kind of fits right there, I guess. Uh, feels critical to me. I mean, why would they have it if it wasn't? Between the Shark's Garage is always about process here, so we are not editing out this mistake. We are owning this mistake. It's a little harder to tell if we're actually tight. Seems like it. I'm gonna give it one more round. Right. I don't have a pointer. 
But right at the bottom of the race there is the spacer. I mean, that's a significant difference, so I am certain that it is indeed needed. Uh, at this point, we can take our bearing, just pop it right back in there. Still should be good to go, still full of grease. We'll take our seal, do a similar thing with the old bearing. Had a moment of crisis that I put the wrong race back in. No, I did not. Can I do this one-handed? Probably not. Maybe. Sure. All right, there we go. I've got to just repeat this process on our other uh, rotor assembly, and then uh, then we'll be back to where we were just a minute ago. Besides dying of the heat, this really isn't, you know, it's not a long fix. It uh, took me about five minutes. So there we go. All right, I quit whining and we are all done. It's probably about 10 minutes total in work. Everything survived, all the seals and everything else like that. Um, I thought it would be worthwhile to just show you guys this. This is the bearing race that I just used as an anvil or as a punch or whatever. I was beating this with a ball peen hammer to knock these bearings and stuff in, uh, these bearing races in. I'm just showing you this because there's like absolutely zero damage on it. And I know that if you've never done races before, it can be pretty intimidating to put a hammer uh, onto some brand new parts. It's all right, they can take a beating. You know, you want to try not to scratch them. So, you know, if you have a really bad ding on your punch, well, go ahead and file that down and save yourself the trouble. But other than that, they're tough. For a reason so just saying that so here we go the brackets are on the only thing i did off camera was uh you know tighten these locking nuts on these bolts this appears to be the way the instructions have them uh kind of makes sense for the caliper angle leans back toward the steering arm uh there we go so it says now it's time to install our actual disc brake rotor assembly which is you know I want to say it feels kind of exciting. Once this is assembled, right. sure, that looks right. Then we can install the caliper on the caliper bracket with the pads and all that jazz. Inner bearing that we've already packed with grease, spacer. We get into this kit, which is a new set of castle nuts, early Ford spindle stuff. This is no longer kit stuff, so. The guy who did not show the spacer in his assembly seemed to have an issue with the castle nuts and he put his old ones on. So we'll see if I have that issue too. I'm kind of curious. It's not great. So back with the stock castle nut and this is the gross, but you can see there's quite a difference between the stock keyed washer and the newly supplied key washer and that may have something to do with the dust caps they supply i'm not really sure i'm going to keep this handy just in case it's easy to get into i mean there's something to be said for brand new bearings and seals too when you're setting up a brake system you know what i mean this is one more you know we're going to call it a benefit of buying all new brand new parts in one spot right i realized i almost forgot this so i'll back this off um I decided to see what the instructions actually said about these uh, the castle nut here. And basically it adjusts your bearing kind of pre, I don't know if it's preload or not, but it says adjust preload as usual, which is really useless. So what I do is I tend to turn it down basically all the way hand tight. And then this is kind of tricky because normally what I would do is take a wrench and turn it to the next point where the cotter pin can fit through the castle nut. But that feels, feels too tight to me. I mean, it feels like I had to really put some effort into it. You wanna get the bearings and everything pulled in real tight, but free to spin without wobbling. That's really your goal. I go hand tight and then just turn it to the first opening so I can put the cotter pin in. And then to test it finally, when you get it back on the car and you put a wheel on it, just, you gotta check everything. So you're gonna wanna jack the car up and shake the wheel around. And if the wheel has any movement in it, you need to start trying to find out where that movement is. It really could be in a loose spindle nut, but it could be in a loose kingpin or, you know, 
You just gotta track it down and find out what's moving. Maybe it's a combination of things. None of them are terribly hard to deal with, but you know, rather than going full crow magnet and really wrenching that down, try to get it. It's, it's a feel thing. You'll get there. You'll try it. You'll know. You'll know. I'm gonna use brake clean for what it's actually intended to do, which you guys don't know this, which most of you probably do. Grease makes brakes grab in a very not good way. We'll slap a little grease on the kingpin. We'll spin that as we go in. Obviously, there's this key in the kingpin that needs to line up with this slot. And then it's gonna get one of these jimmy jams that is machined in such a way to hold that spot right there so everything spins and the kingpin stays in place. That's the idea there. The guy with the two holes, steering arm with the two holes, goes on the passenger side because for a cross steer setup, these are factory 4678 Ford spindles. The steering would come off the pitman arm, come across here, go to this thing, and then a tie rod would connect this side to that side, making both you know sides steer together. I mean, it's good that that's kind of a tight fit because it needs to be kind of a tight fit. So if you look through this hole right here, you can see that it's a round hole. That means that your kingpin is lined up, uh, the notch is lined up with this hole correctly. If it's not lined up correctly, you'll see like a protruding kind of part of your kingpin. So there you go. We need to install the shoes in the caliper. The calipers are right and left. If you're ever not sure which caliper is which, bleeder goes on top. Well, that doesn't feel right. Maybe I need to go take a closer look at something. Next screw up, um, again, not a big deal. I just assumed these brackets were symmetrical, which if you look at them, they're clearly not. So when I was putting them together, I was looking at it and I looked at the instructions and I was like, okay, it claims to go through this hole. This is the top of the spindle. Kingpin goes through the top. This is up, right? Steering arm down. It uses this bolt hole, this bolt hole, and this bolt hole. And I thought, well, all right, I guess. And I put it on there. And I was like, man, that is a very, very weirdly high position for a caliper. Because usually, with this brace, they kind of live like over here. Well, it turns out, if you flip that guy around, that's much more right. This is it assembled, and I tried to put the caliper on, and obviously, A, it's weird, but B, it's interfering with the spindle, and... There I was getting all frustrated being like, come on, man, you still don't have to modify these spindles. And by the way, there's no way to like grind on a kingpin. So I'm gonna flip these brackets around to the right position. They both ended up the same wrong way. Uh, fortunately, it's not a right and left issue. It's just a this away or this away issue. Uh, the whoop de doo goes on the lower side. And then that just kinda Kind of jams it, get it all lined up. Just holds it to the piston. Other shoe, other pad. Nah, <laughs> shoes are for drum brakes. I'm still not used to it. So I'm pulling these bushings because that's just what it seems like I need to do based on the hardware they supplied. So I actually need to go grease these. So I think there's probably 287 different kinds of disc brake hardware at this point. So. I had to pull these bushings out. That seemed to, you know, go ahead and push through. Everything feels a little bound up, but I think it will relax over time. So if I just grab the bracket, I can slide the whole caliper, which is kind of what I would expect to be able to do. And that's really all it needs. All right, all right so there it is. I'm gonna go ahead and get the other side done and uh, We'll see. I'm not going to bother with the brake lines and the banjo fittings and stuff like that yet. I'm going to leave these calipers sealed for now. We're going to call this installed as soon as that side gets done. All right, first things first, let's talk about the kit. A couple minor hiccups, just didn't find the inner bearing race spacers. Uh, that wasn't a big deal. The brake caliper holder brackets I put on backwards. That took not a lot of time to figure out. Flipped them right around. No big deal. Overall, this thing was super easy to install and it is going to, I mean, it's some standard, standard GM style disc brakes. So I expect very good performance 
All right, for me, looks are important, but looks are not everything. And these are going to be covered by fenders. This is absolutely the best braking system for, that I can get for this type of car. Um, I am gonna do F1 brakes on the Roadster because it's open wheeled and I think I can make that safe. But economically, this is a better performing and cheaper setup without a doubt. I don't know, you know, my aversion to disc brakes, I can't, I can't tell. I don't know if it's like tradition or if there's this other part of me that like back when I started doing this stuff, it was the tail end of the 80s and 90s street rot thing or a guy's bragging rights on a car was about how much money he had into it. And back in those days, a disc brake setup was really, really expensive. And I gravitated to the guys who would take the early Ford juice brakes that these street rotters had like kind of cast aside as scrap metal. They would take those things, rejuvenate them, put them on their car and be like, this is how it was done back in the day. And uh, so it was kind of like a punk rock, you know, thing to run the early Ford stuff because it wasn't just trash. And I think there's something cool about that. But just like punk rock, you know, things change. You can now buy a disc brake kit way cheaper than the early Ford stuff. So the early Ford stuff is now kind of like your high dollar street rod thing. You can buy Ramones t-shirts at Target's. Y you know what I'm saying. Long story short, I am super happy with this kit. It went together just like they said it would. It was relatively simple. Compared to other brake systems, the fact that I didn't start with a single part except spindles, and it was $389, free shipping, and arrived at my house in two days, I cannot build an early Ford setup for that price, and it would not perform as well. I know I sound like a broken record, but, you know, this stuff used to be out of reach, but now it's extremely affordable and I have absolutely no question that it is the right setup for this car to keep myself and any passengers or any friends I let drive it as absolutely safe as possible. So obviously you got to do your own, you know, you, you got to weigh your options, you know, stay safe, really do consider that. But there are several ways to do that. This is a great economical way to do that. It's very serviceable, it's inexpensive, and it's very easy to do. I understand if you have an aversion to kit stuff if you're trying to build a hot rod because it's about fabrication. But don't forget, like, is this the hill you want to die on? You know, because it's going to take you, you can work around this and but it's gonna be hard to beat this system if you assemble the parts on your own. You can build your own caliper brackets. You can do all of that stuff, but you're gonna put a lot of time into it to get back to the same place. A lot of the things about hot rodding these days, and you know, this car is a great example. Guys like you and me, we've got to restore our cars partially enough to even begin hot rodding. All right, so this build is moving super quickly at this point, which I'm pretty excited about. The other 27 is gonna be built here, hopefully sooner than later, and we still have the 47 Mercury convertible project going on. Uh, oh yeah, and we're building a motor for the truck. So if you're into any of that, please consider subscribing because it's a huge help to the channel. I know everybody else wants you to do that too, but you know, hey. Anyway, uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Good luck on your projects out there. We will see you next time on Between the Sharks.